welcome in to another episode of the Your Entrepreneurs Network podcast. Today's guest is someone that I've wanted on for a while, man. I've wanted on for a while. I've known him for a while. I've worked with him for fucking ages as well. And yeah, to coax him on, well, I didn't take much coaxing, to be fair. But yeah, Hamza, incredible guy, you know, knows his way about the strength and conditioning space, knows his way about the physical therapy space, um, you know, helps run an awesome gym, gym in Glasgow. Very well polished. Um, entrepreneur, to yeah, to an extent, to an extent, to an extent. Do you want to tell the guys a little bit more about yourself, Bill? Uh, well, I'm a strength and conditioning coach or a performance coach, um, as the new name goes by. Um, and yeah, I work with athletes, I help them um, enhance performance and I help them recover faster from injuries. And I also help them um, do physiological testing, which is we are the only one in Scotland that do it, so we can um, help them perform better. Amazing. And how long have you been doing that for? So actually, I started off as a personal trainer um, more than 10 years ago. But I knew from since the day I started that eventually I would go into sports performance field. Yep. I didn't know how and when. Um, the goal was to finish my degree in cancer research, move to Australia and study there. Um, and when I'm 28, which I am by now, I'll start practicing as a coach. But that didn't turn out. I dropped out, um, moved city, um, got changed my degree, uh, met a lot of coaches around the world, um, and slowly moved into the space of sports performance after COVID. Amazing. Um, so yeah. Amazing. And what um, I guess like oh, so many ways that we can take this, mate. The athletes mm-hmm. that you work with, what kind of you know sports are they in? So it's funny in the world I'm in. Um, usually you have coaches that specialize in one field. Mm. So you'll get coaches, for example, boxing coaches. Um, they will do everything. Um, they won't let their athletes leave the gym uh, and they will handle everything. Which, you know, um, keeps their ego happy, I guess, but it affects the athletes. Whereas in certain fields, um, they go out and look for strength and conditioning coaches. So I've had a bit of everything. So my first actually very athlete I coached, um, were not just one, was were, were quite a few, was at university where I was studying. I was lucky that um, I got a job there before um, I graduated and I continued on uh, developing that job further, working with sprinters, uh, national level sprinter for Scotland, international golfers um, that represented their country, um, Latvia, I believe it was, um, and also um, young athletes who were on the performance squad for Scotland to go towards Commonwealth Games and gymnastics. Amazing. Um, so that was my first take at it with athletes. Yeah. Uh, my first professional, professional athlete, like officially that I worked with, um, was a professional boxer from Glasgow called Nathaniel Collins. Um, at the moment, he's um, ranked, I believe, top seven in the world. Um, and uh, yeah, so that was the journey. That's where it all started. And here we are three years later. Amazing. What was some of the work that you were doing with, say, it's Nathaniel Collins? What was some of the work you were doing? Uh, so at the start, actually, it was pretty intense because the field of strength and conditioning is pretty dirty, let's say. I guess you can say that about anything, <laughs> right? But in my case, the problem wasn't um, um, what to do with the with the athletes, is understanding what not to be done. Okay. So, because you can take so many approaches on, you know, what can be done with an athlete to improve performance. Um, I think when you take, when you change your perspective on it and look at stuff that's not necessary, not needed, um, then you can start to figure out a picture um, exactly what needs to be done. So with Nathaniel, for example, when he started, um, we did a lot of physiological testing just to work out his view to max where he sits um, so we can track that and develop it long term. We put that in late, simpler terms. View to max is basically, long story short, is um, your endurance, your stamina, okay. you can say, okay. right, uh, which is extremely important for boxers. And uh, we worked a lot on his uh, strength and uh, I don't want to say that word, but boxing specific drills, yeah. which later on we'll go back to, but they were not boxing specific. Um, but yeah, and uh, at that time he was fighting for his Commonwealth title, um, the first um, title he had, um, which he won. And uh, yeah, and that was the start of it. And then from there over time, we evolved our methods um, on how we approach clientele, not just athletes, but everyone to give them the best possible solution in the smallest amount of time. Yeah. And I think that's something that sort of I've always been impressed by, mate, is the fact that you're 
like you're a true obsessive at heart. I remember when when me and Hamza started working together, um, we spoke about taking days off, and I was like, "What are you going to do in your days off, Hamza?" Mm-hmm. And he was like, oh, "I'll just sit in my bed and read articles on different types of strength and conditioning, different types of physiotherapy." I was like, yeah. "Mate, you're a true, true obsessive," and I think that's how you've been able to almost like evolve through, almost like not through being taught by mentors or other people like you've actually evolved through gathering data compelling it together and testing it with athletes yeah um d- again you know I'm, I'm saying the word problem a lot because it is you know ultimately uh, in the world we're in as entrepreneurs we're solving problems yep. giving people a better solution um to what they already have an efficient solution as well not just a better solution and you you need a mentor in any industry, it's, it's very, very important. Working with you, um, you know, um, reinforces that thought mm. th- or that belief um, that you need a mentor. So growing up, I did actually look for, looked up um, to a few mentors, but sadly, um, both of them passed away. Um, one of them passed away a few years ago and one of them passed away recently. Um, so one of them was called Charles Plickin, um, very big name in the world of sports performance, mm. um, passed away a good few years ago. And then another one called Louis Simmons from Westside Barbell. Um, which is um, like yourself, a hidden gem that you don't know. But once you find out, and when the when the name gets out, um, they grew very, very popular. Mm. And uh, that was one thing I really wanted to do because they did offer a uh, internship that you work very closely with Louis, um, hand to hand. And obviously, he's not here. But if he was, that was my goal this year to go to US for ten weeks. Um, nice and spend some time with him uh, because that can accelerate your growth by like 10x yeah. um, instead of you gathering data. And I've, I feel where I am with my business and with uh, my mindset and knowledge on how to work with athletes and non-athletes would have been way ahead if I had mentors and if I had people um, that you can look up to that they can tell you, well, don't do this, you can do that. So that way you save a lot of time making stupid mistakes. Yeah. Um, which I guess in a way you, you can look at it from a positive perspective that it really reinforced how I look at stuff. Yeah. Um, so for example, when it comes to no problem solving, I'm very quick at it. Um, that's due to spending so much time just observing, yeah. making comparison, um, changing, and then getting it wrong, getting it right again. I guess that gives you this mindset that you become very efficient when you look at problems, which yeah. working with a mentor can also happen, but it's a, I think it's a skill set that you have to develop on your own. You, that's something you can't buy. Yeah, I feel that. Because I feel like if you, you can go out there and get like, all the information in the world, but if you've not got all the yeah. components around it, it's, yeah, it can be peak. Um, obviously, like with what you do, obviously you do the strength and conditioning side of things, you work with athletes, you've also got PHS therapy, yeah. physical therapy side. So yeah, so that's the interesting one. So when we set up the business, um, I think personally, we were ahead of the curve. Mm. Right, uh, because sometimes you get the timing wrong, that the market doesn't need you yet, mm. and you bring um, an immature product out. Um, immature in a sense, the market doesn't need it, and also because the market didn't need it, you never used it, so you never really had the experience to make it better. Yep. So when we started up the company, the goal was to build a base, a foundation for everyone, to bridge the gap between uh, personal training and performance which is available at a bigger institutes like Team GB, for example. Yeah. Um, you know, you will have access to facilities that you can't even imagine, mm. uh, and every person can. So how can we bridge that gap? How can we change the industry we're in, which is becoming boring, repetitive, um, and people are realizing actually they need more than just a gym. Yeah. So you see a rise in high rocks and hybrid coaching and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, so because we started as, as one big group, you know, having enough experience, only having two members, um, we put everything under one roof. So HS Athletics was offering um, strength and conditioning services, um, sports therapy services, which also included injury rehab, nutrition services, and also physiological testing as well. Yeah. And uh, that became a problem because uh, our message to the community, or to the people out there wasn't very clear on exactly yeah. what we do. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's why going back to my point, um, the problem I have is not necessarily figuring out um, what to do with an athlete. Yeah. It's what not to be done. So you save your time not working on stuff that you are passionate about, but the athlete doesn't need it. Yeah. Um, and that problem also goes into the niching the market where um, because you've started everything as one, um, 
it's not very clear and you struggle also yourself uh, because you want to market the whole thing to people yeah. and show this look we, we are so smart we do all this stuff that no one else does yeah. but people don't know what, who we are what we do why we're we doing it there was no yeah. hype there was no no a process behind it when it came out yeah. um, so that's one thing we learned so when we realized that um, to make things a little bit easier we split into HS therapy um, HS performance lab and um, HS athletics Nice. So the athletics part um, provides strength and conditioning, which is run by me. Um, HS therapy, which provides injury rehab and uh, sports massage services, yep. which is run by my business partner and myself. And then the performance lab, which we are testing at the moment. Uh, we're in the process of actually getting it up and running. And that would be run by me as well. Awesome. Um, yeah. Where did you acquire all the knowledge to be able to do all three different avenues that could be businesses on their own? <laughs> So I, when I started, it was never to learn all these things and do them on the own. It was always about one thing, because if you take an athlete, right, it, that's my experience over, over years, right? So when you go to university, especially if you're studying medicine or anything related to medicine, you're taught to work in a AHP or allied health professional manner where you have a team of podiatrists, physios, doctors, um, MD specializing in their own field. And they all work together and communicate to serve a patient or a client. Yep. Right? That's the structure in medicine or NHS at the moment. The problem with that is that let's say you are a podiatrist and I'm a physiotherapist. I can't speak or understand your technical language and what you do and what benefit it has. You know that. Yep. Whereas to me, I'm the best. My, I matter, you don't. So when I was studying, um, that's what's all up in the industry is that... Um, People are always arguing about stuff where they're supposed to be working together. Mm. And if that's happening at a scale where someone's, uh, you know, someone's life in someone's hand and they're working at that level, it's not, you know, it's not a good sign. Um, and that trickles down because yeah. it's coming from education where people go and study universities and that obviously goes to the workspace and that keeps growing because the source of it doesn't change. Yeah. So I looked around and I thought, you know, um, I'm a tech guy. I love tech you know, especially high performance tech, right? Uh, because I wanted to be a fighter pilot. So I study a lot about planes. And one thing I realized while I was studying, not studying, but you know, like passionate about planes and about tech is that um, the company Apple, you know, Apple, for example, a lot of people say, you know, they didn't create the iPhone and they're, they do this, they do that, you know, um, all of the bad publicity they get. Yeah. But in reality, if you look into what they did, what they achieved was very remarkable. Because for a company like that to have a two, three million, uh, trillion market cap, um, they must be doing something selling phones, right? Yeah. That no other company is able to touch. Oh. And when you look behind them, um, what they've done is they've taken technologies from different parts of the technology world. So the screen came, the screen idea came from Xerox, which was a printing company. Yeah. Right. Um, the battery idea came from somewhere else. The phone, the software, what their main thing was software. And then they put it all together into something which became very, very unique, which was the iPhone. Um, so when I, was, when I was reading about this, I thought to myself, well, you know, um, I have never specialized in any field. Um, for me, it's always been about creating the best product for the best person out there. Yeah. And that is never one thing. Mm. And my experience of working with um, physiotherapists, for example, was the exact same process I explained uh, with allied health professionals. They would look at a problem, um, you know, send me an email over, saying that's the problem with your client and that's what needs to be done to be fixed it to fix it um and we'll work on the problem but the question became right your solution is as good as your problem understanding skill set so if you don't understand the problem um the solution you provide would also be a kind of waste of time in a way and i was getting complaints from clients saying well i went to this physio it's not working i'm spending this money and blah 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 and i thought to myself i was like well why don't i go and do a course in sports therapy Yep. And it was being offered by the university where I was studying. And that way I can um, charge people more money for different services and they don't have to go anywhere. And plus it allows me to see them from a higher perspective and work with them even better. So I did that. Um, and then in the meantime, um, COVID happened. Um, we got invested in physiological testing a lot. Um, and so we purchased ICUP and got enrolled onto the courses for that, finished that as well. And then realize, well, we can charge for this service as well. Yep. Only to come back to realize, actually, um, that was a bad idea because um, 
it works very well in a country or space where um, there's a lot of athletes and Scotland sadly is not one of them, mm. right? So we had to come up with a more, a different or a more unique solution, which was um, separate ourselves out so people can understand who we really are. But then also as a high ticket offer, offer people a unique package um, and that way you can give them all your services. Yeah. Um, and instead of just being a SNC coach, um, you're more of a performance consultant that looks after people's health so they keep performing. Yeah. We went off a point. I don't know what the question was. So if you remind <laughs> me again. <laughs> we went so, through so many different ho hoops. Yeah. Mate. I think we started with the difference between H HS Athletics and HS Therapy. But I think there's important things to touch on, mate. Like yeah. one of which is like the, the bespoke mm -hmm. process of like a, a giving to people the solution that they need based on the exact problem they've got. I know that was a big challenge for you to begin yeah. with. Yeah. So would you not know about everything? I mean, it's one of those, like, when we first started working together, you had all these things under one roof, right? And it was, the, the beauty of it, right, like you said, as a high-ticket offer, it holds an immense amount of leverage to be mm -hmm. able to go to someone and say, I have, like, all these three different avenues that can help you mm -hmm. from a performance aspect. But obviously what you found was that you were struggling to convey that message through marketing that, so that people really understood that this bespoke solution like it's it's kind of hard to say that you've got a bespoke solution without being able to explain what that bespoke solution is, and so, a lot yeah. and a lot of times you were applying that bespoke solution to exactly what the person's problem was. So mm -hmm. if they had a shoulder issue, you could literally sit, do some movements, mm -hmm. detect some problems, and right there and then offer a bespoke solution. But you mm -hmm. really struggled with trying to put that in marketing because mm -hmm. every every person was different. Mm -hmm. So um, with the high ticket offer, for example, right, because you know you can charge a lot of money for it because you're doing a lot of work. It's different. Um, you can, you know, do your leads and all that and then, you know, sit down and have a consultation with clients and really tell them exactly how I can help them. So, for example, at the moment, um, I'm working with a guy who is a training for Ironman and he wants to be on the podium. That's his goal. Not to win the World Championship in Ironman uh, because if he started a bit earlier, that would have been a possibility, but at least to be up there with the people, um, you know, ranked like top 100 in the world. Um, which is crazy actually. Um, so Iron Man is like triathlon on steroids. And then you get Iron Man Extreme, which is, you know, gets even harder. <laughs> um, so if flat surface running is not enough, you add in mountains. Yeah. Um, you add in trains like in Nepal. Um, so that's what he's doing. So now working with him, um, now he's, you know, you will like this, it's perfect client, <laughs> right? Why? Now his age, for example, he's that is in that age where he's speaking as a, as, as as an athlete, right? right. Um, he, you know, has a good job, very well educated as well. Um, so he sees the value inside it, right? Yeah. Um, funny enough, actually, on a side note, how I got him as a client was simply he was in the gym, which I've been seeing him for forever, and uh, spoke to him one day. He's like, "Well, I'm working with this coach. I'm having these issues with my hip flexors, with my hips." I was like, "That's easy. Let's have a look." Had a look, no problem. It got better, and since that day. Um, he's not leaving us. Um, they made it clear that um, if I'm going to go work with any other school coaches, which I'll come back to, um, one of the deal he had was that if they don't work with us, he won't work with them, which okay. is crazy because he needs them more than we need him. Yep. Because as an Ironman athlete, your Ironman coach is more important than your strength and conditioning coach. Yep. Um, but ultimately, if you don't have a strength and conditioning coach, a good one, um, you will run into a lot of problems. Hmm. Um, so anyway, going back to Fergus, um, so now if I take that bespoke solution, which I offer to him, right? He, we, we don't sit there and think about, um, you know, do you need a VO2 max? Do you need um, uh, uh, this type of test done? Or do you need this type of training done? Or you need this rehab or this, none of that. When I speak with them, I tell them, well, you're performing um, as an athlete in Ironman, which is a very, very tough event. And what your goals are, well, he wants to be the podium in the top one in the world, cool. This is what it takes to be there, right? And that's the sport you need. And we can give you that, right? And the, that's the cost and that's the time frame. Yep. As simple as you don't have to worry about anything. So he doesn't have to go and tell us, be like, by the way, I think I need a view to max test. No, you don't worry about it. We figured out your problems. So that way we've taken all the stress off them. Yep. So now his focus is his work and his training and that's it. Yep. Put his training on the, on the app, he sees it and he does it. It doesn't have to think. And that takes away a lot of stress from athletes. Yeah. Um, because when I was, if I look back at myself playing, um, 
close to semi-professional basketball, actually. I'm 5'8", so I'm going to make it as a pro. <laughs> um, that's a big thing because when I was on my own um, as a kid, you know, I didn't have enough money to go get a coach. Um, I just saved up enough money to pay myself to go into the basketball camp mm. um, so I can get access to pro coaches. Um, I was doing more nutrition. I was doing more training. Um, I was doing everything myself. Um, and I was managing it extremely well. Mm. But once you, you know, um, grow up, you have other, respons- other responsibilities and you realize actually it's a full-time job being an athlete. Mm. So the more, um, and especially athletes, not just professionals, people who are enthusiastic about what they do as well. Yeah. You know, there are people who, like Fargus, for example, my uh, the client I'm speaking about, he works full-time um, and he also trains full-time. You know, that's literally his life. Um, you know, and then obviously has to make time outside that to see people, so on and so forth. But his life evolves, revolves around that. Yeah. So f- by us being there, um, we're like the engineering team in F1, for example. Yeah. Right. We're not in the car itself racing. He's doing it. But we make sure that him and the car itself is in peak condition. So he keeps performing. Mm-hmm. And once you have that level of sport right there um, available at, at a click of a button. Yeah. So, for example, if he calls me right now. Um, more or less I will get back to him straight away because he's that client yep. that he needs me otherwise he wouldn't call me yep. and that if you think about it from his perspective um, that's the thing he loves mm. that he can focus and he's performing he's getting better and uh, he can reach out to us for anything anytime and that goes back to one point trust yeah um, so when you trust him and when someone you know I guess everyone it's different, but when you're passionate about what you do and you want to grow it to a very big level, that can have an impact, um, not just um, financially, uh, but also actually on the on social, socially speaking, on on the people. Um, people will put a lot of trust in you, so that's what's responsibility is as you get bigger and bigger and you get um, better and better in your business, um, and that trust you have to serve. And uh, for you to solve that, um, you know, there, there, there is no um, break from educating yourself. There is no break from um, not thinking about the business because the way I look at it, if I'm on my day off, what do you do? Well, you stay home, you close your eyes and you read. The thoughts don't go away because it's still in the back of your head. And, and the best thing is I get a majority of my problems that I can't fix um, outside of the hours that don't work. So there is no time for... Um, not thinking about it because I guess it's different for people but for me um, when I think about it um, especially in my days off I get more creative with it and Mm. and it's fun and it's so enjoyable and it's a form of recovery almost yeah whereas what burns me out um, is working with clients all day one-to-one yeah so you know realizing that um, you know and going back to the point of you know one-to-one high ticket offer and how you portray that these are like i would say the you know foundational skills that i've learned um that you pick up as you go along um and it allows you to shape your offers um to clients very very uniquely yeah as well because you understand what you're capable of and what you're best at and that allows you to understand your client better and therefore come out with a very bespoke solution right there and then um but then again doing that process online for some reason i can't just think (laughs) um yeah Whereas, you know, um, doing in person is, is, is straightforward. Yeah, you know? I think what you're indicating to me and like what can be applied to any business is that you're just, you're skill stacking, like you're stacking these skills yeah. up. So actually, that's a very good point. Um, when we um, go into the business of physiological testing, right? The reason most people, by the way, don't do that business is because it's extremely um, expensive, problematic, and uh, a smallest inconvenience will can end up costing hundreds of pounds. Yeah. Right. So, for example, your filter is broken. Well, good luck because you have to order a very special filter from this very special company um, that won't reply back to emails. <laughs> yeah. um, and the website looks like it was designed in 1998. Mm-hmm. Right. But no one else can do it. Um, or stuff like, for example, a small piece of it would, let's say, or the wire breaks. Cool. That would be £750 for replacement and a two-week waiting time on top of a lot of other stuff. So a lot of people go and don't go into it. But when we did get into it, obviously, um, you get a lot of, you meet a lot of different people who are up there within that industry. Yeah. And one of the people 
was, I don't want to say his name because I don't know what he's involved in, um, was uh, head of education for the company where we bought our equipment from in Greece. And we had a consultation with him. And he said to me on the consultation is that Hamza, you went through my certification. I was like, yeah. Um, he goes, did you like it? I was like, it's very unique and different, you know. Mm. And I could feel I was like his, his, his thought process is very similar to what I'm thinking. But I know he's the person I need to speak to. Right. Because the, the, the thoughts match. He goes, Hamza, I designed it because I know you won't be taught this at university. That's something you can take, learn it and apply it and actually works with people yeah. because it's something I've done. And his background was working with the Navy um, on aircraft carriers. Um, he was part of the Beijing Olympic Committee. He was a um, qualified physiotherapist, qualified um, sports nutritionist, um, sports performance coach, strength and conditioning coach, which is basically the same thing. And also a very, very informed person when it came to human physiology. Mm. Um, so after speaking to him, I realized actually we're on the right path. We're just a bit further ahead, which goes back to the idea of skills, uh, skill stacking, um, which from the technological point of view, the word in the industry is disruptive innovation, yep. which is taking things that already belong, putting them together in a way that gives you a unique solution that doesn't exist, didn't exist before. Yep. So by speaking to him, um, I realized actually you being a coach is not enough because you're lacking understanding and you're only understanding the client from one dimension. Hmm. So that's when we went into the field of um, sports therapy, sports nutrition and skill stacking um, to mix those skills together to provide a very unique bespoke solution. Because yeah. that's why you're able to, you know, um, think fast on your feet while the person is in front of you. Um, you can go over quickly their uh, biomechanical assessment, physiological assessment, nutrition, have a view, chat with them, see how they move. And that's all the data you need. Yeah. And that's you know, that data collected from different skill sets I've built goes into my head, does something, and then I have a solution. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's extremely important, I think, skill stacking. Yeah. So it's a very good way to um, really mold and break what you already know. Yeah, I think like, I mean, there's not many people that I've come across where I'm able to, like, I feel like even doctors don't necessarily do it the way that like, for example, when I came to you, for example, like the shoulder injury, mm -hmm. ankle injury, like anything that I've had a problem with, I've came to, it's your ability to make me feel really ease really quickly. Mm -hmm. Whereas like, I'm sure everyone's had an experience when they went to the doctor and it's like they start telling them things and they start going, mm -hmm. oh, mm -hmm. yeah. and, it's, and it actually makes you feel really fucking uneasy. And it's why people hate going to the doctors, mate. Like see, when I think about my, like my granddad was brutal for it. He would be sitting there in excruciating pain yeah. and it'd be like, my grand, my grand, like you need to phone an ambulance, and they'd be like, "Nah, nah, 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 I'll be alright, I'll be alright." And it's yeah. like, and I think it is that, it's that. It's yeah, I can. I mean, I can tell you stories. Um, I've had outside, um, you know, about the health services. Um, just that we don't get cancelled, so we don't speak about it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like there is, you know, I, I have worked in hospitals. I have worked alongside professional doctors, um, people from all over the world. Um, you know, and I have worked very, very closely, obviously, uh, when I was studying my degree, um, part of the degree is that you spend a lot of time in hospitals on placement. Um, and I was with the, obviously in the cancer unit. Um, so you see a lot of, um, you can say horror stories. It's the best way to put it without, yeah. you know, sugar coating it with anything. Um, and it's sad to see because at the end of the day, you're working with, you know, um, clients and your job is to serve them but you don't because um the soul is taken out from the job itself mm. so when i was in the department um doing my placement i looked at all the equipment they used um the scanning equipment all the fancy stuff um yeah it's worth millions of pounds to maintain and to buy and to upgrade and it's special and techy and you know but outside that the usability of this equipment is very straightforward. Yeah. Like um, like scanners, for example, MRI scans and PET scans and all these scans, right? One thing that always baffles me is that how long it takes them to produce results. Mm. Um, and you can say, you know, they're busy in this and this and that, for example, but at the end of the day, for example, that technology is there for you to make your life easier. Mm. And clearly it's not making people's life easier because protocols and policies, for example, make things harder than they should be. Mm. So 
my point being is i didn't see the point in my degree yeah to go into cancer research and study that and become a medical doctor through that field because me spending 3 months there i learned more than actually i learned from studying um so that you know begs the question for example is um why is it that someone who's trying to help you literally with your life um you don't look forward to going to or speaking to or having a conversation with yeah. my personal take on it is my one of my very very close friends he's a doctor he just graduated from Aberdeen and he's working as a junior doctor and then he wants to specialize um and in psychiatry yeah. um extremely smart someone actually should have on your podcast actually extremely knowledgeable um when it comes to human nature um and dealing with humans mm-hmm. um and one thing I learned from him is right so and one of my clients actually who's a doctor um <laughs> they work so take take my friend right he's a junior doctor he's averaging about 60 hours a week yeah right now if you're averaging 60 hours a week working in a department as a doctor which already as stressful as it is right which i believe should be 30 hours not 60 hours and then you go home you have no time to sleep or be there anytime to sleep eat or socialize right how badly that would affect your health mm. right and then that trickles down as well so now you have education they go mm. right which has a lot of holes inside it lack of experience because doctors for example here um don't do a lot of intensive placements they only get to see the nhs system they don't get to go to do a placement for 3 months in paris and realize actually for a big city like that with a completely different um healthcare system how does that operate yeah it doesn't allow people to go to for example um in countries like um japan for example and do a 3 month placement there and see mm-hmm. how that works out um as well and when these guys come back for example they will have a much broader knowledge on what medicine is and how it's supposed to serve people yeah. and that for example will also allow them to make decisions hopefully um that can impact the industry moving forward yeah. but now you don't have that and then you have the overworking burnout um idea so the doctors for example themselves are not in peak condition to give you peak advice yeah. because you they, they, they're under tension right you come in you have 10 minutes to talk mm. right you know i spend 50 minutes talking to clients about random stuff right um and about the problems yeah. um and that allows me to figure out the problem yeah. right because i know you know um i don't have to directly speak to them about the problems because that's what they're for they know that i know that so in the back of my head that's my main goal but when i speak with them it's for about me understanding how they experience that pain because yeah. if you uh, have shoulder pain someone else has shoulder pain it could be the exact same problem but your experience on how you express your pain how it makes you feel how it impacts your life changes yeah it's it's different for everyone um and sometimes you know um it's not even that serious which actually to be fair in most cases it's not even that serious unless you leave it for very very long and you can't move your arm that yeah. that be serious um so when clients come through the door for example you need to have confidence in yourself number one that you're able to fix it and have yeah. that belief um at least um and working with John for example with yourself that's one thing i've picked up not something that was taught directly by yourself but something up you know by observing how you coach um is how i pick up things yeah. so when i look back at our conversations it's not what you've told me as how you've told me um and then observing you know how all that connects together yeah. and that takes time so yeah. that's so for example you know we'll have a chat and it takes me a few weeks before i yeah. catch up and process in my head and once you do that you know um you see the client differently mm. because the pain they're experiencing you know um you know i've been you know i've had i've had an ACL injury myself playing basketball um had to surgery on my knee um and i've been out of the game for 18 months right and if you are passionate about sports or just about active lifestyle yeah right that is the closest thing to clinical depression mm. um you know because you can't do something you love right mm-hmm. and everyone you go to for example would tell you 9 months 18 months you know 3 years and that was my thought process you know as i was actually walking here for the podcast i thought about it um at university for example when you write your essays about certain topics you're told no one cares about your opinion mm. over time that's ingrained into you 
why so when you write your critical analysis or, or your essay or what you're writing in a union dissertation or whatever it is you want to support everything you say with evidence right. even if the evidence is a lie and you know it's a lie it doesn't really matter because what you say doesn't matter what the evidence says matter so my question then became in my head is i was like okay but the person who wrote this is also a person yeah where do they get the evidence from for someone else but if you keep going back someone has to say it mm. right to believe yeah. in it for it to come out so that conditioning over time when you start working with athletes or anyone anyone um that's how you start to look at clients right yeah. my opinion doesn't matter what i see doesn't matter right so what does the textbook tell me right so that's why i don't know if you have the experience i've had it multiple times you go to the doctor with the problem and he pulls out a book yeah and then he's typing something on his computer i'm like right i'm sure he's googling something <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah um absolutely. You know, and then his conclusion is cocodamol and paracetamol. Yeah. So I'm like, well, you could have just told me this when I walked in. You know, it's a painkiller. Um, so your solution to my pain is kill it. Sorry, not kill it, numb it. So yeah. don't feel it and hopefully it'll go away. Yeah. I think um, like three things I'm taking from what you're saying. Like yeah. one, like disruptive in innovation, like in any industry or any business is something that a lot of the time you have to um, like be willing to go against like all advice, all like all uh, previous evidence like everything of that nature and you also be you must be willing to actually post on linkedin today about that which is like i feel like a lot of young entrepreneurs out there are incredibly impressionable so like they'll have a thought they'll have an idea they'll take it to someone is their first thought and that individual will be like ah nah that probably won't work or that I've, I've, I've seen someone try something similar like that and as a result man like they're, they're stopped in their tracks so how do you like how are you so willing to like just go against like the curve i'm not you know the, the kind of person i am um how i grew up for example naturally i'm that person who goes against the green mm. but that's not someone who i've been brought up to be yeah the person i've brought up to be is a person who is smart not intellectual meaning that you know you can read books and memorize some stuff and put it into action right so growing up for example my parents my my family people around me wanted to be wanted me to be a doctor because to them it's a smart person, it's a good job and so on and so forth. Now, um, that's the person I grew up to be, um, you know, to listen to others, to listen to the teachers, because you believe in the system. I yep. can use that word. Um, but the sad truth is, it doesn't really matter what the system tells you, right? Or what people tell you. Because it's people ultimately telling you. Yeah. And you're people, you're a person too. So what you say also matters. And when you grow up with this idea that your words don't matter, right? Yeah. Um, in, in education, so you must look for evidence. Mm. So now let's say I'm working with you and I have this epiphany that, um, like once, for example, one of my clients, professional athletes, um, basketball player, signed in Ireland with the team, um, had, uh, I believe, an ankle issue. No, actually, it was a knee issue. He had a quad contusion, and which wasn't healing. Contusion is basically when you hit a muscle really hard. Yep. Um, and it bruises from inside and it takes a while for it to come out mm. um, and that could be very very painful it feels like doms but that just won't go away yeah um, on a very localized part of your body so not going away well they send him to the team physio they, they tried everything um, it's not working it's not healing um, I have a chat with him online um, I was like cool leave that with me for a bit I'm in the shower I have this epiphany I'm like right that's the problem so that's been about three months the conclusion is not going away went on the phone with him told him what the solution was um he tried it in about four weeks fully healed it mm -hmm. was fine right now that wasn't something i learned from textbook or something i can find evidence for yeah right uh, but what certain people will do is for what i've done they will be like oh well see there's a paper here so you've done that but you didn't know about it mm -hmm. so it is research no it came from my thought process i don't read that paper Yep. That paper seemed to be existed at some time, which I never knew about. But now I know about it, I might learn more about it, right? But ultimately, it's your intuition, yep. right? In any job you do, you know, um, it's your intuition that you have to listen to because, you know, to wrap all that up, the 50th law by Robert Greene, right? One of the quote which is stuck in my head and I love is, it's not exactly how it's worded, but it's something along the lines of learn about the music, learn to play the guitar, and then forget everything and just play. Mm. Which is that, and I think that for me has been a big game changer when it comes to looking at clients and giving the bespoke solutions and going against the grain. 
is realizing number one who I am and not who I w- was brought up to be. Mm. That differentiation. Um, and second um, is believing in yourself to an extent where even if something is wrong, you think you have that doubt, but your faith is so much stronger that if you go with it, something good would happen. And that's the risk most people are not willing to take, mm. right? Because there is no promise at the end of it. Yeah. You know, so when I started thinking like that, um, it's very scary because you're like, I don't know if I'm going to do the right thing because I'm, I'm playing here. Um, and I don't know where I heard this or, or, or I've, heard, I've heard it multiple times, even from some of my close friends, um, is that, you know, when you look at these people at the top, billionaires and uh, people within power and who are making a change and impact, they're playing a game. Yeah. You know, they're not sitting there thinking, slashing their head. Uh, you know, f- f- it's a game b- because they've gathered necessary knowledge. They have the necessary school set. And now it's about, okay, right, let's try this, see what happens. You know, yeah. no man in the, in the, you know, will wake up one day and be like, right, I'm going to make rockets. <laughs> let's go to space. Yeah. Right? There must be something important there that people don't see yet. Yeah. But he believes that it's important. Mm. Now, he might feel at it. And it turns out to be a big thing, big problem that no one needed rockets. But you don't know that until you try it. And that's where innovation occurs, is by mm. trying something you believe in, making a mistake and then changing it. So ultimately yeah. playing. But what I believe people make the mistake is they just start playing instead of actually learning the rules. And yeah. that takes time. That That's where you do your um, apprenticeship hours, when you spend yeah. 10,000 hours on a task, on, on a certain topic to master. Yeah. But when you're actually doing the job, you're not thinking like that anymore. Mm. Because the thinking you do to learn, it's different to thinking that you do to apply and make a different make a difference. Yeah. Um, two different processes. So those two things, I believe, um, is what allows me to go against the green, and something that I have to develop over time. Yeah, and I think like um, I mean, I I feel it very often where like there's quite a lot of one of the things that always sticks out to me, right? Just random example, Ellis, my accountant, right? See when he looks at the amount of gifts we get clients, uh-huh. he's like, they're not tax deductible. Uh-huh. Why are you buying so many fucking gifts, uh-huh. right? Gifts make me feel fucking amazing, right? When I receive a gift, it makes me feel amazing. Mm-hmm. When I give a gift, it also makes me feel amazing, but it also makes the other individual make, like, makes them feel amazing. Yeah. Now, from a from an advice standpoint, I love Elsie Bits. He is there as my accountant to challenge me on anything mm-hmm. numbers related, right? When challenged on something as small as that, for example, it's so easy for me as an impressionable young entrepreneur to be like, oh, that's wrong. I shouldn't do that. Yeah. Let me just stop, right? And it's not... He's actually not challenging me for me to just stop doing that. He's challenging my thought process, which is either met with like one or two things. Either I'm going to roll over because I, I realise that the point that he's making is very strong. I shouldn't do that, whatever it may be. Or it actually makes me um, stronger and my, my conviction conviction levels rise. Because by challenging me, I'm like, well, no, because it's super important within our culture that we like we show gratitude towards clients for them believing in us. Yep. We want to do stuff like that. We want to take them out for dinner. We want to send them gifts. And that just becomes part of like our culture. And through doing so, sending a new client today, send him a voice note, send me your address, and he's like, "What? Mm-hmm. That, that's like, but you're sending me a gift? I, I, like, I've only just joined on. I'm like, I don't like in my head. It's not even a conscious thought anymore. It's just like that is the way we do things. And like that's something simple from a disruptive innovation standpoint. That like people can take that and apply to like anything that makes you feel fucking good, man. That you yep. could somehow course out your business, whether it's um, whether it's the norm or not, like fucking try it, bring it into play. Yeah, um, you know, I, see the idea of you know, for example, you love receiving gifts and love giving gifts, right? It goes back to uh, there's a book called uh, the Five Love Languages, I believe, right? Mm. And it talks about people's. Um, it's a psychological book um, written on relationships, and it speaks about um, how different people express their love differently, and how people receive love is also different. So some people, for example, would love, they love words, words of affirmation. Yep. Um, um, and that's their love language. Um, you know, for people who've had a lot of experience, let's say, in dating in the past, and if you put that together, you'll start to see um, why sometimes with certain people it doesn't work out. It's because, you know, um, you know, like I'm like you, for example, you know, I love living, uh, give, giving gifts, you know, to people. That's um, why I got a shit ton of... Amazing guest as you turned up. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's just a nice thought. Be like, well, I'm gonna go see him. You know, he'll really enjoy it if I take this, right? Mm. That kind of thought process in your head, you know. Um, and uh, 
so yeah, I mean that that just something in my head I was wanted to share with you. But also, you know, when you go through that process of, um, or oh, you know, your client might like this, he might. What you're ultimately doing is developing a, a relationship with the client. Yeah. Because think about your love relationship and how you're with clients. You know, mm. apart from the int- intimacy part, right? It's pretty much the same, right? You, you, you know, you'll think about them at points, you know, and you'll message them. Um, you care for them, you know, um, if they're going through something, you're there to talk to them. So it goes outside of what just the business is. And yeah. that's something which I actually, you know, um, I, th- I spoke to you about recently, a few months ago, actually, now, was when I started my business, that's what, how I started it, by just giving. Yeah. But to the wrong people, mm. which take and take and take. Yep. You know, and they never give back. Um, and then you start to f- form a belief that I should not be that person. Yep. I should be that arrogant person who doesn't give anything for free, has strict rules, you know. So I, did, I tried that as well, and that doesn't work either, <laughs> by the way. Um, people just hate you more because they can't take advantage of you anymore. Um, so I guess if you, you know, from, from your point of view, it comes from a very selfless act yep. that you take care of them um, and you do what's best from your side. And if they, you know, um, react back to it, it's fine. If they don't, it doesn't really matter because yeah. it's not about them. It's about you, who you are as a person. And yeah. that's something, again, you know, I just learned recently, you know, why, for example, um, certain companies, um, not certain companies, a lot of companies, for example, especially successful ones that make an impact would have a philosophy or a culture section on their website um, or something that they, like an ethos they've written, like Porsche has it, for example, right, um, that they've written this history, which is their philosophy. And that philosophy needs to be integrated into each car they manufacture. Well, so no matter what Porsche you sit in, you get that same feeling, mm. right? Um, so that's integrated the DNA. So for ourselves, for example, now, um, that's one thing we have to develop is our core philosophy and our culture. Yeah. Um, because that is what you stand on. That's your medium, yeah. um, you know? That's like your field, you know, where you plant the seeds and it grows and it turns into eventually the garden you want it to be. Yeah. Um, and that's very, very important to begin with because a lot of people at the start when they do a business, I guess, they leave that part, mm. which is fine. You can go, you know, just focus on sales and make, make your money. But eventually there comes a point where for a business to find its roots, it needs to have that culture, that yeah. philosophy, that commitment, that mission that you stand for. I mean, like we had a, we've got a client that we signed like towards the end of December and he actually went into, he works really high up within quite a lot of corporate companies and we're also running like an e-com business. He went and got like this brand new job, like super high salary, like was meant to be fucking immense. Um, you know, signed the contract, fucking was buzzing for it, left his previous job to go into it. He had a lot of funding going into his e-com business because it, it was so, such a high paying salary. Um, and then he went to the awards night and one of the guys, one of the sales guys made a joke about um, like the amount that they've sold even though the product's shit. And yep. this guy, I wouldn't name him, but he was like, what do you mean the product's shit? Like I was told the, the product was amazing. And for him, like he can't sell something that he doesn't truly believe yeah. in. Yeah. And they were like, oh, like the, the product's shit, the turnaround time's terrible. Like there's actually like no real, like for us to be doing like the numbers we're doing with this product is like pretty fucking crazy. Like mm-hmm. we're some of the best salesmen here. Mm-hmm. And that for me just like proves that like, like Leila Hermosi spoke about it when, when she goes in from an acquisition.com standpoint, companies either have one of two problems. They're either got an incredible fucking product, but they don't know how to market it, or they know how to market it, but they're a shit product. Yeah. And it's like marketing and sale, but it, it's something that like, from, from a philosophy standpoint, and also just from like a human, human to human standpoint, there is no way on earth, mate, I could create something that I believe was shit and just go out and sell it. Yeah. And, and you know, that's your personality. Yeah. And your business has a personality. And that's one thing I'm learning, you know, um, over time. And, you know, and working with you is what ignited that fire to keep learning even more and more about business. Um, is that same idea when it goes to disruptive innovation as well, that um, when you, for example, the way I look at strength and conditioning and sports performance, energy rehab, ultimately human performance, that's the goal, right? To get you to where you want to be and even further. When you look at it from that perspective um, and you you know, sell a product, no matter what it is, personal training, strength and conditioning, toothbrushes, doesn't really matter, right? Um, a lot of people, for example, you know, you can, you can 
sell a very shit product to a lot of people. And that tells you a lot about the market, mm. right? That is it you that can't place yourself from the market or is the market actually rejecting you? So for example, for us, um, we never marketed for our business, right? Um, but not at one point, um, I believed just like yourself that I want to sell a shit product. To me in my head was like, same thing with basketball. I said to myself, if I can't be in the NBA, I'm not going to play basketball. Mm. I might enjoy here and there, but I'm not going to take it that seriously. Because to me, if you're not being the best at what you do, there's no point you're doing it, mm. right? But at least having that um, um, dream to at least innovate to that level, even if you don't get there. Mm. So when it comes to strength and conditioning, same idea. When it comes to sport performance, same idea. I create the best product or service that people um, can have, yeah. go above and beyond it, right? Because some, somehow, you know, um, if, you, if, you, if you're giving more to clients, um, they can never come back to you um, and say anything negative because you've d overdone so your, something yourself. And that is also one way you can create confidence in yourself as well. Going back to the point um, is knowing that you've done everything you can and plus a little bit more for the yeah. client, right? And that way, you know, for example, what they've paid for is definitely 100% worth it. Yeah. Um, you know, so what you're doing ultimately is creating relationships with clients, right? Oh. Now, what did that do for me, right? I didn't in the market. Um, so how do I get my clients? I always used to stress me out, right? But one thing I realized over time was um, they'll come back yeah. when they need you. And when the mm -hmm. time's done, they'll go. And that's something not in your control. And when you do a good job with a the client, they'll always come back. Yeah. And that's what I've made majority of my business is through recurring business, not looking for new, new, new people. Yeah. Um, and that recurring business, for example, um, provides me with very solid feedback. Meaning that, you know, um, if I spend, you know, 2K on ad spend and I develop this community and I take care of them and I nurture them and I feed them um, in person, online is a bit difficult for me to do, um, you know, they will always remember you, mm. you know, like, like again, going back to Fergus, for example, I can't imagine him going anywhere else. Yeah. I can't. And if it does, I know it's a loss for him unless he goes to somewhere in one of the top facilities in the US, which, yeah. you know, like 10 grand a month or something will pay. Um, yeah. But then he deserves that. You know, and that same philosophy we inject it into our um, coaching side of things when, when we work with other coaches. So <coughs> they, um, I've got two guys on internships which are going, who are developing themselves into um, coaches that I wish I had, mentors I had, they could help me develop into. So something I wanted, I couldn't have. So I'm doing it for the next generation. Now, when I work with them, um, I'm very, very um, straightforward. Um, in terms of what do they expect? Because, again, going back to the point of, you know, people selling shitty products, right? When you work with them, it's very, very clear, right? You pass that philosophy on to people. And now they will go on, pass the philosophy on to the people, and people see that as well. And that, again, you know, um, if you think about it, is reinforcing a bigger community than I build, yeah. right? There, there's no need to sell shitty products because... Yeah, you make your money, right? But uh, again, you know, if you believe in the world outside of the world we live in, um, you know, um, the faster you make money, the faster you leave your hands. And, and usually in a business where you're actually nurturing people and helping them, it grows over time. And if you look back at the rate of big, big companies and they are still alive to this day, that's what they've done. Yep. And Apple being the best, biggest example, right? Their job was to serve people with the best computers. They were yep. not the best at the start. They were really bad, right? Yep. But that philosophy is what took them to again, you know, um, two, three million dollar, trillion dollar market cap, which is again, immense to see for someone to start making shitty computers, yeah. right? But believe that they can make it better, believe they're serving people yeah. and they were actually were and how far they take them. And people who didn't do that, those companies don't exist anymore. You know? and, I, and I think that's, there's one example always springs to mind when it comes, but well, I say always just recently springs to mind. Um, it's in a client, uh, Ben Pearson. He runs like a e-learning education yeah. company. I think I spoke to you about him before, mm -hmm. but for anyone, any listeners that don't know Ben, um, the e-learning education platform, it provides like accredited qualifications for like professional development, so management, leadership, coaching, that sort of set of things. Um, and I remember, so as of like February, we, it was like the, yeah, end of February, beginning of March, we crossed the VAT threshold, right? And it was like, I remember when I first started out in business thinking, whoa, 85 grand, holy shit, that, mm -hmm. that's fucking crazy. And it's went up now to like 90 or whatever it is. 
but I was like 85 grand holy shit um and then also after crossing that, I was just like, this is like a small smidge and like the actual yep. capabilities of how much we're going to earn, right? And I remember just like sitting with Andy and Andy was like, this is crazy, isn't it? Like when I joined, we were at 1.4k a month, times that by 12. Mm. It's like fucking 16 grand, right? So we've done a, quite a lot in, in a two year span. But when you compare it to like everything you see online, you see people doing all this crazy shit, being in Dubai, all this sort of, sort of different aspects, it can very quickly dilute it. Yeah. But also, yeah. when you actually start to really put time in the game and like put years in the game, you start to realize that you're developing this knowledge that the money that you earned a year ago seems so easy to make now and that will continually move forward. And I believe it's actually on the point that you've made and it's what Ben made. When he, Ben Mesh was saying, congratulations, brother, on Smash the Bat Threshold, super proud of you, fucking amazing achievement. Um, over 50% of companies in the UK aren't bat, even bat registered. Like, you fucking, like, he, he was really, like, fucking, you know, banging the door on it. And I was like, as much as, like, I'm so grateful for this, mate, like, I don't actually feel that accomplished. Mm -hmm. um, and he went, the difference that you're not realizing, mate, is that you've built this in two and a half years at a quote-unquote in your mind slow rate but you've actually built the foundations that's going to allow for you to fly yep. at rates that you never thought was possible which is just the point that you're making yeah and if you look at if you get some time um just type in disruptive innovation into google hmm. and you'll see you know it's, it's from like um i don't know what you call them but like you know there are guys when it, go, when it goes to education you know you know i've made a few bad points about education not all education is bad you just need to know what you want and who's providing it and it's difficult to find where you can find someone. So, for example, personally, I'll say it. I want to go back to um, university and do a master's in sports medicine, right? So I can differentiate myself better from physiotherapists and create a new market uh, for sports performance and rehab where people actually take it more seriously. Because, again, going back to the doctor's idea, um, people are scared to go to physics as well. Mm. Um, my mom was uh, shit scared of coming to you as a physio. <laughs> well, see, that's yeah, what's in my physio. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. I, get you. Um, I can fix you, but I'm not a physio. <laughs> um, but, you know, um, what was my point I was trying to make? Um, Disruptive innovation. Yeah, so if you, yeah. you look at, um, you know, education, there is a lot of um, people who know what they're doing in terms of education, when they deliver education, right? But sadly, um, they're not everywhere, and you really need to know where to find them. So, for example, to me, when you go to, um, let's say, Edinburgh University, right, which has one of the best facilities for sports performance, right, in Scotland, yeah. um, after, I believe, Lowbro, which is, like, sports performance on steroids, yeah. with unlimited money, I guess. <laughs> um, you go to their facilities, right, and you're like, you, you, you know, you're not there for the modules, yeah. right, because... You go into any website, university website, and they will tell you what they teach at university, right? You can do some Google research and find all those modules, right? Um, to, for example, I did my dissertation in two weeks without a supervisor using Google Scholar, yeah. right? Um, if I can do that, you know, trust me, and uh, I'm not good at it, right? Anyone can do that degree, right? Yeah. And that's with the majority of degrees, right? I'm not just saying this so people say, oh, he's smart, he's good at it. It's nothing to do with that, right? It's about, it's about your ability to think. Mm. So going back to this, so these guys, you know, um, they, um, you know, um, the guys who study um, and look at world economics, how the world moves. So there are people you can look up to. So when you look at these people who teach economics um, and do consultancy for big, big companies, um, you can start to see that they, you know, they, they've created stuff that you can study and read and help you understand the market better. So disruptive innovation, for example, is one thing that I love to look into. Um, I forgot his name, the guy who came up with it. Um, but it's a whole book, it's a whole idea um, on in and understanding markets and how they move, how they shift when it comes to innovation in tech, because the tech world moves too fast for anyone to keep up. Yeah. Um, and again, going back to the skill stacking idea, you can learn skills from there that could be applied to a different industry. Mm. You know, And again, that's what we're doing. Is taking lessons from the tech industries and applying it to our industry um, because I feel or not feel I believe um, it's a much more efficient way of looking at problems and coming up with solutions. I mean it was what actually drove forward the thought process of creating YNL as a quote-unquote open network in terms of like it's not industry specific 
So if you look at majority of like high ticket masterminds, yeah. they're like they're niche. Do you find a, you can find one for fitness coaches fucking left, right, and centre? Yeah. Um, but like the open network side of things, there is a couple of studies on it that I think are outstanding in regards to, um, the the spread of industries, the different exposure to different businesses, how it actually impacts your own business by being yeah. able to take things yeah. from. So for example, you know, um, let's let's talk about you know going back to university, right? So when, now when I went. Before, my mindset was, you know, um, I'm going to go there, study, and they're going to give me some secrets, that, and I'll become a coach. What I never thought was, there's about 6,000 other people, sorry, 6,000 other people, I'm getting amped up now, <laughs> 6,000 other people waiting in line to get in the course, right? So what yeah. makes me special? Nothing, mm. right? It's just a machine churning out degrees, right? So now I thought about it, I was like, no, hold on a second. You need to have a different approach on this because let's say you want to be in the world of technology and you want to take health and performance and create something in the technology world that uses data to fast track um, monitoring and uh, helping athletes train better, right? And that could be turned into a product in the tech industry. Um, you need education for that. Either self-education, right? Or education from the right places because it's, you can't just go there with an idea. Yep. Right, because now you take guys like Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, for example. They might not have a lot of degrees, right? But they're very well, let's say, connected, and they read and know about their industries very well. Yeah, like it's very famous for Elon Musk to, you know, he taught himself everything about rockets. Mm. Right, he doesn't have any rocket science degree, but he's got people who got degrees and work with him. Yeah, right. So when you change your mindset as well about education, um, not just education, anything you take and how you how you how you give it to the world. Um, you know, the goal is now go back to university, right? It's not about studying those modules, hmm. right? It's about looking at the space they have, how they utilize it. How do the, you know, professors talk to each other, right? Um, what kind of professors are working there and what impact they've had before? You know, what kind of um, experiments, their work, research they're working on, right? That could um, impact the tech world tomorrow um, or the health world tomorrow, yep. right? So when you go in there with that mindset, you're not just there for a degree. Right, you're there to deeply analyze um, something um, that you believe you can take and change the world with, yeah. and that can go into other sectors as well. On how you speak to people, for example, how you talk to people, and how you explain them your business and what you do, and simply just how you think, and that could change as well. So again, you know, it goes all back to um, everything we've spoke about so far: your mindset. Yeah. You know how you view the world. Because I, I believe it was Rick Rubin who said, you know, um, your ultimate gift to the world is how you view it. So sharing with the world how you view your world is ultimately your gift. And if you think about it, you know, um, that's ultimately what we're doing. Hmm. You know, you see the networking um, world in a way that you share it with the world. Yeah. I see the something interesting from my world and I share it, you know. So if you think about it now, reflecting back on everything we spoke about so far, um, it went from... I'm gonna be this person, develop this person, and instead it went on. I'm gonna focus on actually what I enjoy, what I do, what are my thoughts. Um, you know, so there's part from my development is also a lot of um, self exploration, um, especially on the psychological side of things. Mm. Um, How do you explore with confidence in areas that? Because that's one thing. So when I'm thinking about young entrepreneurs, right? If I'm thinking about an entrepreneurs like maybe come through YNL, 19 years old. And they're wanting to do things, but you, you feel the level of uncertainty in these things that they feel like could be game changing, but they're not, they've not got the courage just yet to actually go and do it. Yeah. Like, how is that even, how is that developed? So, right. So the coaches I'm interning, right, they're 18, both mm -hmm. of them, right? And I was 18 at one point, no long ago, 10 years almost. <laughs> um, and I remember on my 21st birthday, right, my dad dropped me outside. Um, I came from Dundee. He picked me up and dropped me out to the gym. I had a client, right? Um, if it was my birthday, I don't take it as a big deal, right? Um, long story behind that. But um, anyway, I went to the gym, I remember. Um, and I remember when I was going to the gym, I was in very good shape. I was very lean because I was competing in bodybuilding back then. And, uh, uh, you know, I looked good and I went in, trained my client. I was like, you know, I know what I'm doing, yeah. you know? That's arrogance, which I believe is natural around that age, right? Mm -hmm thinking you know everything, right? Um, or you're very good at what you do, right? You're like, uh, back then when I was 18, I thought I'm the guy, I know everything. And now I look back at it, like everything I knew was wrong as well, <laughs> let alone knowing, knowing anything. Um, so in, in young kids, that's the problem I feel, is there's not enough self-exploration, mm. you know? 
it's about oh i saw this guy on tiktok do this so i'm gonna to jump and develop this idea they're not i feel um and again that can work as well but i feel they're not connecting to the goals they're setting themselves they're not connecting to the vision they're setting themselves mm. they don't see the why the philosophy the mission and that those things take time they never came to me you know day one and and when it, when it comes to developing that one thing I, one of my friends said to me actually was confidence is about is a collaborative approach right mm. so one way for you to build confidence is to realize is that the idea you're working on you know um what it is you know um it's not yours mm. right it came to you yeah. right um and once you have that belief right you don't attach yourself to that idea right because then your anxiety your so lack of confidence gets attached to the idea itself as well mm. right like you you make your sure identities that you're one that are one person yeah. whereas when you look at it from perspective that oh okay if this idea came to me let's play with it right let's explore it further let's see what it can do for me instead and also you know i guess the, the idea of pressure from society as well mm. you need to do this fast you know you must be you have a mortgage by the time you're 25 have kids and do this and do that and all that so people are very you know stressed to make money <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right fast yeah as well it's like i'm because i can see that because i've been that person where you want to make money fast and just relax then mm. right but you know what you said on your i think it was on linkedin or instagram you posted you need to have set clear goals and once you reach that goal right yeah you can take a small break but then for men especially you need another one to keep yourself moving like a bicycle what you explained yeah. otherwise you know um you know you got just become bored mm. you know so for example um and again this idea i've taken from sport performance but apply to you can say psychology or 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 self um or so word development um is that now in sports performance is coming a big thing where too many people are specializing too young mm. what does that mean so if you take um a four or six year old right and let's say he needs to become a world champion cyclist all he does from the age of 6 until he dies is cycling right yeah you've not let him explore right mm-hmm. the fundamental skills that are required for you to become an athlete right are found in a unpredictable environment so for example do some just do some boxing right you do cycling cool maybe try um track indoor cycling right and then slowly slowly you 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 as the brain closes its development you also start to close in on specialization mm. with the young entrepreneurs i feel that's with myself as well as um and skills stacking ideas as well they're too focused including myself when i was doing it on one single subject mm. right which means when they start to think about okay i have to get this out of the world they start to panic yeah. right because they don't know how to do it because all they know is that product or the idea they had mm. like i did right I have no idea on marketing. I have no idea on brand building. I have no idea on um communication, market um c- copywriting. I would I, I don't I didn't even know these things existed, yeah. right? I have no idea on simple on what business is, you know, what market is, how it moves, what's the difference between, you know, um um supply and demand. Simple mm-hmm. simple things, right? And why do I buy certain things, you know? Um why did I, you know, um buy this product? Yeah. So once you start to look at a different way you will start to build different skill sets and then you niche them down into a specialist skill for you to become an entrepreneur what would you do and i feel because of that it's also a lot of confidence because what is confidence i guess you know confidence is your ability to carry your task knowing that you're capable of achieving them mm. so lack of confidence is you know having confidence in yourself that you can achieve those tasks and what do you need to to achieve them well read and take action yeah. you know take action is a big part by the way Yeah. Yeah. I think it's um yeah, yeah, I think that's all fucking awesome mate because mm-hmm. I think it is something that like I see a lot of young entrepreneurs struggle with even like when I think to myself like the first coach that I had like I used to go to her for fucking everything. It was like oh I'm thinking about putting this post on LinkedIn, what do you think? Oh, I've got this problem with a client, what do you think? Oh, I want to maybe do this idea, but um I don't know, so like what do you think? and it's like just this lack of overall like certainty and i see it like very like very very often and i think it's because like you said there's like this kind of there's a spectrum where it's like arrogance and like like absolute like 
arrogance and then like an absolute lack of confidence in certain to actually go on and take action to move mm-hmm. forward. You know, the way I describe it is, you know, um, I'm a visual learner. So everything I do, I try to make a visual image of it, right? Yeah. And also, if you look into symbolism, right? Symbols talk to you a lot. That's what the purpose of symbols is, yeah. right? Is to pack a lot of information data into some mad Egyptian letters, mm. right? So when when you're um, working with any client, any person, doesn't doesn't really matter who they are, right? You you know um, yourself are not very well connected to you, right? Because you again goes back to the idea of intuition, right? Is you you don't listen to your own self. You always pay attention to what people have to. So, for example, you going back to your coach and asking what needs to be done, what needs to be done, mm. right? I've been there. I've never sat down and thought to myself, what's possible of me doing it here, you know? Um, oh, maybe I think that's the thing. Oh, uh, yeah, but I don't know anything. Why would I do this, mm. you know? Um, and then again, and then the coach himself, I guess, they also need to reinforce the ideas well in people's head is that um, that confidence aspect that is something you develop on your own, right? Yep. And when I say visually, to put it on, confidence and arrogance, I personally believe can't coexist. Mm. My belief on it, right? It's because if you put on a scale, right? Let's say negative here and positive here, right? Arrogance is here and confidence is here. Yeah, You need both of them at time for time, mm. right? You'll see certain people in business are absolute assholes, right? But they need to be at that time and moment because that's what's needed out mm. of them, right? Um, if you want to read more, 50s history, 50 cents history. Um, if you look at his biography, you, that's one example. Yeah. Because um, going back to actually Robert Greene, I'll come back to my point. Um, he explains stuff in ways which my mind understands, mm. which is um, he'll make a point and then will make you travel back in history in places to confirm that point. Yeah. And then he will try to paint a picture in your head on how that point affects people now. Mm-hmm. Right, so it's very, you know. So when I look at it, confidence is here, arrogance is here. You don't need to be fully confident at all times, but neither arrogant, unless you're required to be. But you need to master both sides. Yeah, you know, you need to understand arrogance when and how to use it, and confidence when and how to use it. Mm. And at times, you're required to be a little bit arrogant, and it requires you're required to be 100% confident in your approach. Mm. And that's the way I personally look at stuff now. Is it's not about necessarily I have it or I don't have it is for these people um, or like any entrepreneurs who are struggling um, to find confidence is because they're being arrogant. And, and when I say arrogance, I don't mean they're being annoying or anything, is they are being arrogant to themselves by not trusting themselves even more mm. and taking some sort of action and always relying on someone. So use this example. Um, if you if you get injured on your lower legs, um, you lower body, you get given crutches to walk on. Yeah. If you never give those crutches, you will never learn how to walk. Right. Mm-hmm. In a way, right. That's what coach is like, right. He's those crutches when you're struggling. He's yeah. gonna help you get back to your feet and mm-hmm. teach you again and again. Mm-hmm. But if you never get off that, right, um, you will never learn to walk on your own. Now it's, it's a very unique angle you take on it right um but that's one way as well is teaching them to have that self-confidence so for example when i work with clients that's the conclusion i came to before it was if i teach my client this he will learn how to do it and he will never pay me so Mm. i'm not going to teach him everything i'm going to teach him what he needs to know and answer his questions but protect my information Mm. what's going on again with your wiring in your head is you're insecure and you're arrogant Right, because you don't have the confidence in working with that person, giving them exactly what they need, yeah. know what you think, right? Because that's what I mean by confidence is collaborative, mm. is that you're not working towards what you think is best. You're working towards what that person is best for that person, yeah. and then you and him together will trust to take action on that project, yeah. right? It's not about I feel this is the best, so therefore you're going to do that because I'm the best, mm. you know. But then again, if you look at Muhammad Ali, there were times when he was very arrogant, and that was required for him yeah. from time to time. So it's finding that balance between arrogance and confidence, yeah. you know, and that's something that takes time to learn. I think the, the crutches analogy is pretty much perfect, mate, because it's like, 
if I think back to that coach that I did have at the time, um, she would often speak about the the importance of not relying on her. So mm-hmm. if like at times, it was almost like her philosophy of coaching was built around guiding you to the answer, but you find the answer yourself. Mm-hmm. Which, like, I think is that's where you start to differentiate coaching to consultancy to mentorship. And, like, people get those all, like, very confused. And I think as a coach, like you're saying, the crutches come in when they need it. But the intention is to remove the crutches and for them to be completely yeah. self-sustainable. Which, like, I, I remember we had, we had a chat at one point and it was, like, within your industry, it's very much, like, um, a client helped is a client lost. Yeah, I'm going to put that on my wall, actually, mm. when the client walks in. Isn't it? Yeah. It's a client cure, is a client lost. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's a marketing stunt. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you're right, because, again, because if you think about it, right, and again, that's something, you know, since I started working with you, I learned over time when I was reflected back on our chats, you know, because the biggest t- takeaway I've, I've had working with you is not learning about leads or offers or any of that. Mm. It's about having confidence in your approach. Yeah. So if, you, if you're going to learn about business have confidence with your learning mm. right and uh, try it if it doesn't work cool do something else yeah. whereas you know most people won't have that um faith mm. to take that to take that jump you know so you know i guess uh, for me you know at least you know learning about marketing business and this this and that and being a coach and you know all, all this if you scale all that back you know, um, to two core skill sets um, that I would build first is my personal self on how I view the world. Yep. So learning about what you like, what you hate. And that comes with trying stuff. You're yep. not going to sit there and theoretically know if you love swimming or not. Um, and also, um, when you... So it's working on yourself, um, seeing the world, but also the idea that you have, that you work on, um, remember it's not your idea, number one, it came to you, right? So that's the way I look at it. So you've been chosen to work on this idea, right? So what would you do? Would you sit there and Google something or would you go down a rabbit hole and figure out the ins and the outs of it? And that will become reparative and boring. Yeah. Are you willing to go through that process, mm. right? Yes or no? No? Cool. Well, you, you, you stay where you are. If yes, like yourself in business, you've seen over time what happens, yep. you know? Um, and that's something that I've done for, let's say, uh, personal development, but I've not done for business development, mm. you know? Um, I think it's because the pressure of business development is that like, you make a mistake, you're going to lose money. Yeah, yeah. Whereas like, because I remember one of the things I wanted to bring up was like, remember we had this conversation where it was like, you had this little like scarcity switch. Yes. Where it was like, lose a few clients, scarcity switch would come on, yeah. fuck. Yeah. So, again, you know, it's lack of confidence within yourself, again, you yeah. look back into, right? Because one of my, actually, ex-clients, right, we went on dinner, and he was in a really bad mood, right? <laughs> now, I don't know what I said to him, he left his job the next week, um, and went to Morocco to travel. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, and he said to me, he goes, you know, one day... And and I could connect with him because he used to think like that. He goes, one day I feel, you know, everything can just go. Yep. You wake up and you don't have it. Like your business is there, right? You have 60 clients. So one day you wake up, you have zero. Mm. It's like, yeah, that's that's definitely a possibility, yep. right? By the same time, it's a possibility. You can have 60 more, mm. right? But ultimately, what you're telling me is, are you not confident enough in your abilities that if you lose 60, you'll get them back again? Yeah. You know? And, you know, once it clicked, that clicked in my head, you know, you realize actually the scarcity switch comes on, lack of confidence. Why lack of confidence? Because you've not studied lead generation, creating offers, and doing some sort of marketing to get more clients. You don't have that process. Well, why don't have that process? It's because I don't know about it. Well, have you studied, practiced, tried anything? No, I haven't because it will cost me time and money, which I don't have in the first place. Yeah. At some point, you have to make that decision. Yeah. You know, um, and it's usually, <coughs> Good decisions are followed by bad decisions. <laughs> but how do you know that? Once you take them. Yeah. You realize, oh, cool, I shouldn't have done this. I should have done that. So I can, that is, you know, again, confidence is knowing that when a client walks in, no one else can do it. Only I can. Mm. And watch. I'll do it in 30 minutes, <laughs> in three months. <laughs> yeah. Right. And sounds crazy because when you say that to other physios online, for example, um, they'll be like, are you crazy? 
if a physio tells you or if a coach or a rehab guy tells you um, something that takes six months you can do in 30 minutes, he's, he's lying. Yeah. Well, okay. You've identified a problem that you think will take six months. Yeah. I haven't identified it and said it will take 30 minutes. Our view, the way we look at it is different. It doesn't mean I'm wrong. It's just what I think is different. Yeah. You know, but again, social media likes um, the idea of, what's the word? Um, stuff that on social media I've noticed recently is um, that gets people talking yeah. and fighting usually gets promoted quite a lot. Yeah. Right. So for example, again, you know, going back to the um, scarcity search idea, online, you will see content that is being on purpose, I believe, um, is being pushed to you where you get nothing out from because you lack the skill set to understand it. And when you read it, it feeds you information that might be incorrect or might be incomplete or might be a viewpoint that you can have a confirmation bias to mm. and say, well, I feel that way, he feels that way, it must be true. And that skill set I'm telling you about is, um, you know, being able to observe, yep. you know, and say, well, okay. So for example, one thing I love doing is going through these posts and reading comments, right? Yep. Because you get to see, okay, he thinks that, he thinks that, so therefore he's saying this, okay, I see what he's missing in his head. Okay, he's missing that point. Okay, he's missing that point. And you start to, you know, correlate data together. Yep. But then again, that comes from confidence, which yep. is that I'm not going to let this post, which is against why I believe in, let me believe that he's right. You're observing it and then eventually coming to, coming to a conclusion. Before, I would observe it and think that, oh, I'm wrong. Mm. Because this guy has more authority, he must be correct. Yep. So I would completely disregard my ideas. And that, like I said, feeds into other parts of your life mm. um, as well. So again, you know, um, you spend a lot of time with your mind, <laughs> yeah. believe it or not, actually. Yeah. So develop that, you know, develop the confidence, learn about arrogance, you know. Um, again, again, you know, Jordan Peterson, ultimately, if you wrap everything up, you know, you should be bad, learn how to be bad, and then learn how to manage it. Mm. Because those are essential skills that you need, yeah. you know. Because if you don't know how, how what a good man is, then you don't know how to be bad, mm. you know. So having that pull between the two opposites, I think that's a beautiful point to finish on, mate. Mm. We are uh, at around 25 minutes in. I don't know if you would have ever guessed that's that. <laughs> We've been going for two, three days. I know, bro. I know. I feel like we've only scratched the surface, mate. We'll need to do a part two, without a doubt. Um, yeah, yeah, but in terms of where people can find you, people, because obviously I know you're planning on doing more content, planning on doing more things mm. like this. I think this should really, when you watch this back, mate, you'll be very proud of just like the, the information you've provided, the impact that you have. So. Yeah, where can people find you, mate? Yeah. Well, uh, our website is coming back soon. It's done at the moment, hsathletics.co.uk. Yep. Instagram, hsathletics.co. And uh, you can always email me, call me, <laughs> Google me, I'm there. Um, and the business is called HS Athletics. Yep. Um, our prim primary way of communicating with people is through Instagram. Hmm. And then when those people usually turn into a community, it's through WhatsApp. So those are the two main channels we use. Yeah. Um, yes, like I said, uh, we've not done a lot of marketing for ourselves. It's been the word of mouth. Yeah. So not many people know about us yet. Yeah. Um, so so yeah, wait for more cool material coming your way. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so Instagram, um, primarily hsathletics.co. Awesome. And obviously John, just <laughs> drop a message at YNL <laughs> and uh, yeah. they will pass on. <laughs> yeah, any details you need of, of Hamza, just let me know. But yeah, I appreciate it, brother. Honestly, mate, it's been Pleasure. amazing. As always. Amazing yeah. episode. Oh, um, amazing, amazing episode, guys! If you're on YouTube, make sure you subscribe. Those episodes rolling out every two weeks. If you're also the same on Spotify, leave a little review. Let us know what you thought was the best part of the podcast episode. And yeah, thank you as always for listening.